You saw Ba'athist members and Al-Qaeda teaming together on these battlefields against the Americans. I served with the Americans. They were trying their best to get Iraqis to build their own cities. Truth is, 95% of the Iraqis at the time were there to steal their own country. Nobody has the guts to say the truth that the people that stole Iraq up to 2003 were not Americans, they were Iraqis. You were fighting terrorists. Yeah. You're shooting at them, you've been shot, been through war, you've lost men, you, yeah. you've led men into battle, you've seen men blow up. The British showing up to Iraq actually was the biggest favor that was ever done to the Iraqis. The Brits actually have helped Iraq. Nobody wants to say the truth. Nobody wants to admit it. You're going against your home country. Did they try to make you feel like a traitor? Absolutely. Anybody that tells you that Saddam did not have absolutely anything to do with Al-Qaeda is a big lie. Saddam wanted some kind of relationship with Al-Qaeda after 1991. America went to Iraq believing that Saddam Hussein had weapon of mass destruction. He tried to make chemical weapons. He's trying to make viruses. You try to do everything. Over the past couple of years, I've been absolutely infatuated with a few characters in history, one of them being Saddam Hussein for various reasons. A few of the reasons are, is I'm trying to understand how someone who was so controversial and hated was also at the same time loved and revered by many. I also want to explore how the Assyrian people were under Saddam Hussein's regime, were affected negatively or positively, and how that resulted in them becoming in the diaspora, such as America, Canada, Australia, and other countries. Lastly, I want to understand if there's any legitimacy behind the American invasion of Iraq in 2003. We're going to get to the bottom of that today. Today, I have with me a man who, at the age of 17 years old, joined the new Iraqi military, and at 19 years old, was upgraded to sergeant major, making him one of the youngest to ever do it. Hamadi Jassim, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here. You are one of the most non-biased voices I could possibly find in the world to cover this topic because you come from a Kurdish, Turkish, and Iraqi background. You were born into a Muslim family. You had Assyrian friends. Then you fight for the side of the Americans. You had boots on the ground. You lived through the Gulf War. You've lived in Iraq during the time. You are one of the most non-biased parties I could find to get perspective of what was happening in that region of the world at the time. So let's start back with your grandfather, however, because he has an interesting story. He learned English in 1921 from the Englishmen who were in Mesopotamia at the time, post-World War I, before Mesopotamia was Iraq. Did he have any run-ins with Assyrians at the time, the native people of Mesopotamia? Can you tell me anything about that? Perhaps from the beginning is he ran away from where he was living in the south to go to Baghdad. And working for the British as a cook have enhanced his ability to actually uh, learn English and pick up a language uh, from them. When you look at the British Empire, when they actually took down Iraq, you would think, you know, they had probably destroyed Iraq or have caused some kind of a destruction to Iraq. In a way, they actually have modernized Iraq. All the systems, the education systems, our military, everything was established by the British. So in a way, the British showing up to Iraq actually was the biggest favor that was ever done to the Iraqis because everything we learned, every basic element in our education and our military was established by the Brits. The Brits actually have helped Iraq. Nobody wants to say the truth. Nobody wants to admit it. Same thing with Americans showing up in Iraq. You know, Americans showed up in Iraq. Was it all negative? No. Americans showing up in Iraq enhanced our ability to think differently. And because of that, you do have young Iraqis today that think differently than the previous generation. Maybe in terms of education, they did benefit them in terms of bringing their culture and what their knowledge was to the Arab nations. But it also negatively impacted the native people who were there because they didn't get a say in which borders were to be drawn post-World War One for their home country, such as the Kurds and the Assyrians. That's true. That's very true. I mean, hey, when you go back all the way to all the deals that were made back in the day where the Kurds should be, where everything should be, I, I don't think these deals were fair. They didn't do a lot of people their due diligence to, to be fair with them. Um, I'm a huge believer that, you know, we didn't focus on the negative side they brought to us. I would focus on some of the positive things that the British brought into Iraq. Well, let's fast forward a bit and let's go to the invasion of Kuwait. So between 1990 and 1991, I believe you were between the ages of four and six. Yeah. So at that time, you start to learn things, you start to hear things. What was the sentiment like when the Iraqi people, your family, your friends, the Assyrians, Christians, they heard Iraq is going into Kuwait, they're invading? People were absolutely shocked. 
because obviously the Kuwaitis were one of the best supporters of Saddam Hussein during the 80s against Iran. Kuwait was actually one of the biggest supporters of Saddam during the Iran war. You can say that the Iraqi people were shocked. Everybody was shocked. Nobody knew what Saddam was thinking, including the Republican guards who were attacking Kuwait that day. And the reason I asked that question is to get to that point of the Republican guards, because yeah. the men who didn't fight fled to the south of Iraq if they didn't invade Kuwait because of the Americans pulled in. And then they made Saddam, I believe, stated the south, southern Iraqis mm -hmm. are cowards and need to be slaughtered. It, it wasn't really these uh, Iraqis in the south that refused to fight against Kuwait. Um, it was because the destruction of the Iraqi military who was pulling out of Kuwait gave these Shia elements the advantage to rise up against the Ba'athists in those cities that was ran by Saddam. So, of course, seeing that Saddam's biggest power was the Iraqi military. And when seeing all his military being destroyed, of course, when you look into how the Iraqi military got destroyed in 1991, it's probably one of the worst decisions that ever been made by a military person. Um, that just goes to show you that Saddam's military skills were not as sharp as they should have been. Saddam himself thought he was done. He was packing his packs to, to leave until Saddam's cousins um, and, and, and son-in-law, who he later killed, um, Hussein Kamal and Ali Hassan Majid, Kamakal Ali, have told him, you know, we have a Republican Guard unit that did not participate in the fight in Kuwait, which is supposedly protecting Baghdad. We're going to take this unit and uh, this division, and we're going to deploy it to the south and give it a last chance to take down the, the revolution that started against him. And that's exactly what they did. So Kamakal Ali attacked with one division of the Republican Guard that was not in the fight in Kuwait. Without that divi division, Sudan would have not stayed in power for one minute because he was getting ready to leave. He thought it was the end. Then that leads to the Republican Guard coming to the south. You were there at the time. Yeah. Your grandfather's farm, your neighbors, yeah. all yeah. of you guys start fleeing into the swamps. Yeah. Tell me it the was, details. It was it. a brutal time, honestly. At a five-year-old, I was confused. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know who the enemy were because all of a sudden you see Americans coming by and then all of a sudden you see the Americans pulling away and all of a sudden you see Republican guards. You didn't even know who was who or who was the enemy. Who, you, who, should you, who should I be scared of at that point? At that point, that was a brutal war, conventional warfare that's going on in the area and you didn't know really what's going to happen next. I think the elders were afraid of the biggest nightmare um, that they were afraid of is comical weapons. Luckily, the Americans demanded, um, and th that the biggest credit goes to Schwarzkopf, who was negotiating with Saddam government, and, and I think that guy was a hero. Um, he was a hero. He was a hero for negotiating with Saddam and limiting Saddam capabilities. Uh, one but, of the deals they made with Saddam on that tent in Kuwait to cease fire was to not allow Saddam to use any chemical weapons, which is the reason why Saddam sent Republican guards in the ground to kill people and bury them alive and not use chemical weapons. Saddam would have used chemical weapons in no time if he was allowed. But because Schwarzkopf had put that on the agreement that he's not allowed to use any chemical weapons, and if he, ha if he does... He be responded to with nukes. But what the issue was with Schwarzkopf is that he granted the Iraqi government access to helicopters yes, post Gulf War, which then, as an excuse to get politicians to get around because the roads were destroyed, communications were out. So he went to the Iraqi government, went to Schwarzkopf, yes. said, Can we please have helicopters? Yes. As soon as he granted the okay without getting approved by the White House or anyone higher than him, they slapped guns on them to suppress Kurdish rebellion which landed in a slaughter of Kurds. Yes, and it allowed the Mi-24s of the Republican Guards to fly and slaughter people in the air. And unfortunately, you know, America wasn't gonna not give him anything because you have to understand when Saddam sent his generals, when he sent Sultan Hashim, who was the uh, Secretary of Defense at the time, Saddam said, do not leave that table without getting something out of that deal. Mm. And despite of his loss, Saddam wasn't really going to give up that easy. So they were smart enough knowing that they lost the war, but they were smart enough to figure out a way to make a comeback. So sticking on the general's decisions to grant them helicopter access, historians and people say that 
if he didn't grant helicopter access to the Iraqi military, that there would have been no legitimate way, effective way of Saddam to suppress Kurdish rebellion and Kurds would have had their own country right now. Based off your experience and what you know, how true is that statement? You have to understand that's not just against the Kurds. You, you know, the revolution in the South was also by the Shia. Yeah, the air support was a main element of his success, but he had a Republican Guard division that was untouched mm. uh, that helped him retake the South. That would have been impossible. Saddam wasn't going to really just walk away. He was going to probably def fight to the last soldier he has, which he did. Um, he used, if we're talking about 1991, that's how he made one of the strongest comebacks. That was almost, I think, that was the biggest Hail Mary that he had back in 1991 to get the South back. So continuing with the Kurds and why they started rebellions, it's known that Iran, this is post Iraq Iran war. Yeah. Iran was using the Kurds to cause civil unrest in Iraq, yeah. giving Saddam a, a, a thorn in his side, constantly yeah. having to suppress rebellion. So there's criticism on the way that Saddam handled Kurds, gassing them, helicopter, turrets from above, all these things. But the Kurds were also letting Iranians through their routes and yes. through their villages, hiding them, smuggling them into Iraq. So in America, even. That could be considered treason, and treason is a punishment by death sentence. Yeah. So was Saddam just doing what any leader should do, or was the criticism in the ways that he handled treason? I'll say prior to him gassing the Kurds, did really Saddam have um, an animosity against the Kurds? I don't think so. Based on what I've seen, he did not have any animosity against the Kurds. He actually liked the Kurds. The problem he had with the Kurds, the Kurds wanted their independency, which is it's their right. When we talk about the deals that were made back in the day to not allow Kurds to have their own country, that's really, really unfair. This is a massive nation that's everywhere in Turkey, in Syria, and Iraq, and they are not Arabs. The problem that the biggest conflict we have right now between the Kurds and Arab, even during Saddam, is that Saddam believed the Kurds were Iraqis, and he did not want to refer anything else to them either than being Iraqi Kurds. You're talking about a dictator that believes in nationalism. The Ba'athists are a nationalist. Mm -hmm. He wanted the Kurds to admit the part they are Iraqi Kurds. And if the Kurds have actually gave him that, that's why he didn't care about them having their own independence. That's why Erbil and Soleimaniya was doing whatever they do. But that's what Saddam's it's about. I understand that, but then why didn't he give the Assyrians the same slack? Why was he more lenient towards Assyrian Christians versus Kurds? Why didn't the Iranians also use the Assyrians to cause uprisings if they were also non-Arabs living in Iraq as well? The Kurds are absolutely more motivated to fight. They mm -hmm. really believe in their in their ideology. They want to be they want to be independent. They want to be them. And the Kurds realize they don't have any friends other than the mountain. The mountain is the only friend to the Kurds and has been through history. Saddam is not stupid when it comes to minorities. Saddam have tried every single political thing out there, used the right people to try to take minorities under his wing as much as possible. But if these minorities were going to be against the ideology of the Ba'ath Party, that's when Saddam would get violent. I do believe at that time, Saddam would have cared less what your background, what your ethnicity. If you have taken the Iranian side, he will absolutely get rid of you mm -hmm. in five seconds. And perhaps I don't think it's even have anything to do with the Assyrians or the Kurds. If Tikrit, the hometown of Saddam, has taken the side of the Iranian, he would absolutely have come a goal weapons that would be used against that place his own his own his home, own hometown hometown he yeah. really did not care between 1980 and 88 yeah. the iran iraq war america is it's no secret america funded saddam in some ways yeah. weapons wise intelligence wise providing them intelligence about what's going on they america essentially used iraq as a proxy to fight Iran because they viewed Iran as a greater threat to American democracy at the time nuclear weapons were in the in the uh, talks and all these things yeah in a way, did America create Saddam Hussein to be the dictator that he ended up being? Of course. Um, I think uh, the New York Times or one of the biggest things here, one of the biggest platforms here in America back in the 70s was featuring Saddam Hussein as one of the most influential people in the world. So was Saddam supported by America during the, the 80s? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. I mean, you know, Ramisfold was in, in, in Iraq back in the 80s and visited Saddam in person. 
And their second meeting was when Saddam was in prison. You know, so when you're talking about how America funded, of course, I think that at the time America wanted to make sure both powers will remain engaged and busy and not allow one to take over the other. I think that America intervened once they realized Saddam was at his last breath and he was about to lose the war. America did not interfere in that war from the get-go, but once they saw Saddam was about to really lose that war, that's when America interfered. But I did know at the time that the Ba'athists were very powerful in Iraq at the time. The Ba'athists were more powerful than anybody. They were feared because it was the only party in Iraq. Everybody wanted to be in that party. So how come everyone couldn't join that party? I mean, everyone could join that party, except that if you had some kind of a records that indicate you have people in your family that are against the party, you probably would not be allowed. How would they know that? Uh, I mean, they, they would know that. Oh, they would. How? I mean, every Bathist has information about every neighborhood they lives in. Um, so they snitch on each other. Absolutely. That, that's the whole point is Saddam have trained a country to become an intelligent agency. People couldn't trust one another during that time. Uh, the wives, you know, the, the husbands couldn't trust their own wives talking about the regime. Brothers couldn't trust their own brothers talking about the regime. My experience is I didn't understand a saying in Iraq. It says a pen can kill you before a gun does. You would wonder how a pen would kill a person in Iraq during that time is by writing a report. The Baathists at the time, they were so authoritarian that a lot of reports were false information. Um, if I don't like you, if I have an animosity against you, if I get a chance to write a report that you are an enemy of Saddam Hussein or an enemy of the government, that's one way of me getting rid of you. So there was a lot of people were executed, were killed, were thrown in prison who really didn't have anything against the government. But the report that was ringing against them stated by a Baathist member that they were against the government or they have said a joke or they have made a joke about the government or made a joke about Saddam. There are horrific things happened to people that made a joke while drunk while being drunk about Saddam. Probably made a joke while drunk sitting by the river and it happened to be someone out there who told his Baptist cousins, this is what I heard from this guy, and that's how these people end up wow. in prison. So basically, whoever's already in the party controls who joins the party. Exactly. And then whoever is outside of the party is exactly. treated as a second class citizen. You have the option to join the Bath Party at middle school. So teachers would come to you and... Teachers are one of the biggest Bath Party members in schools at the time. Hmm. The biggest fear was teachers. My own principal in middle school carried a gun. I will, I will, I will never forget a, a scene in middle school. You know, middle schools in Iraq are brutal. School was absolutely one of the worst nightmares for me. I was too scared to go to school. And I will never forget the mentality that Saddam implemented into these Baathists in Iraq. The way they talk, every single person was exactly copying the personality of Saddam Hussein. In my school, the principal was pretty much mini Saddam. The math teacher was like little mini Saddam. Everybody was a mini Saddam. To this day, there are people who would act like Saddam Hussein. They admired that personality. They admired that authoritarian person. And I will never forget uh, my principal, who is an extreme Baathist. I don't know what happened to him. I, I would think he probably got arrested after 2003 or went to prison or whatever happened to him. And he stood in the morning and he said something. And it, the point of it was psychologically to, to plant fear on the student hearts to make sure they never respond. He said, every morning you guys walk in, some of you will say to me, good morning. And if I hear that one more time, someone tells me good morning, I'm gonna slaughter you right in front of here, in front of everybody. And if you see me again, do not say anything to me. And I just literally looked and I'm like, you could get slaughtered and beat up in front of 600 people for the fact you were nice to say good morning to the principal. <laughs> and I just literally looked and I'm looking at like, that is education in Iraq in the 90s. And I was terrified. Were there Christian Assyrians in your school? Oh, yeah. We have plenty of Christians. I mean, I have a lot of Christian friends at the time, you know. I mean, Christians, the poor guys, you know, they were, they got nothing to say. They're a minority. Um, How were they treated? I mean, they were treated fairly. 
I mean, they were treated fairly. Look, to be honest, Christians were not mistreated by Iraqis. We loved them. I mean, we loved living with Christians. We loved everything about them. Um, we learned a lot from them. And they were the most peaceful, peaceful people in Iraq, honestly. Specifically Assyrians. I mean, Assyrians, uh, some uh, other minority Christians as well. I think we have people of Armenian descent that are also, you know, um, uh, Christians as well. Actually, some Christians were working for the government. Some Christians were working for the government of Saddam. I know Christians who were working in the Iraqi intelligence at the time. So don't let um, don't let the, the minority thing fool you when it comes to how Saddam Hussein carried himself. Saddam Hussein had a minister of foreign affairs that was a Christian. Saddam Hussein did not care what your religion, what your background, what you are. Saddam cared about how loyal are you to the Ba'ath Party. Do you believe in the Baptist principle versus your religion or your background? And we all know, and most people would know, Saddam was not a big fan of religious Baptists. Hmm. It didn't work out. And when they asked him why, I mean, they told him at the time, and it was by his debit, he said, you know, we're Muslims. And, you know, we are, you know, there's nothing wrong with being religious. And Saddam said, you know what? If the Baptist that goes to the mosque and a praise in a certain way versus the other Muslim who prays in another way, what do I tell the Christian and the small minorities in Iraq? So that's a proof to show you that Saddam actually cared about these minorities and wanted to make sure they belong in Iraq more okay. than anything. But let's, let's transition to this. Yeah. You mentioned that if you spoke English in Iraq at mm -hmm. that time under Saddam, it was considered the language of the enemy. Oh, of course. What would happen if you were caught speaking English? So I'll, I'll give you a story about that. Um, you had nobody to speak English to. That's to begin with. Um, if you spoke English on the road to somebody for some reason, yeah, you'll end up somewhere under the ground. Dead. But, oh yeah, you'll absolutely be done. Because you, they will think you are communicating with foreign intelligence, that you work with somebody. But I'll give you a story that I've never talked about. We used to have some kind of a festival. It's called the Baghdad Festival. People from all countries will bring their technology or their trucks or their production and represent. So it will be Koreans, you know, Chinese and other countries and Latin America, uh, whatever countries, of course, except for America. But inside of these buildings, it will, will have the flag of the country and you walk in. And you'll see, I, I saw French people. Uh, I saw Germans. I saw people from different backgrounds. If you have spoken to one of these people, in which language would you use to speak to one of them? It would be English. You know some people who make the mistake of having a conversation with, let's say, a French man during that time. These people will be taken to the Iraqi intelligence quarters and questioned, depending on how long your engagement was. So actually, when I was a kid and I walked, I walked into the show with my family, they said, if you get engaged by any foreigner, do not speak back to that phone. So when I walked into, actually, I still remember the French side of the show. And a French man tried to talk. And I looked back at him and I pretended that I did not understand what he said. And kept walking away and did not engage him. He said something to you in English and yeah, you understood. And I did not respond. But you, you, you knew Because I looked said. at how many eyes were looking at me. Mm -hmm. The eyes were on him. Mm -hmm. But if you expose yourself to that point, and I remember people who had conversations probably about what kind of car is this and probably talked about cars and probably were interrogated mm -hmm. into what was said um during that time so when you're talking about saddam saddam was the head of iraqi intelligence before him even becoming a deputy of the of the the president ahmed hassan al-becker at the time saddam was an intelligent operative and that's the bottom line and he have made sure there are ears and eyes everywhere, including your own family members. So the only language was Arabic? It was Arabic. Okay, so yeah. now this gets back to my minority point yeah. with Assyrians. Assyrians yeah. have their own language. Kurds yes. have their own language. Yep. What happens if they were speaking anything other than Arabic? That was not an issue. Really? Yes. Actually, Saddam had um, implemented uh, the Kurdish language in the schools at the time. Has uh, We had a class we used to take learning the Kurdish language because his goal was to get everybody under the same umbrella is to make sure we understand each other despite of our background and at the end of the day we're all Baathist 
So it wouldn't be fair to say, you know, Saddam had put down the small minorities over others because of the language or their background. He actually didn't force people to speak Arabic. Um, he learned some Kurdish himself. There are videos of him trying to speak to a Kurdish man in his own language. Um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what kind of a dictator Saddam was and what his ideology was. And it's kind of crazy because in some ways you'll find Saddam that very politically correct with you until you disagree with his ideologies. So it's, okay, it's purely political with him. It's yes. not so much culture and ethnicity. No. So let's get into some of the issues with the prison systems under Saddam. So it's no secret that he had some of the cruelest forms of torture ever. Some of them being the following executed whole family bloodlines. If one member of the family spoke out against Saddam and the government, he would break glass into men's rectums in the prisons as a form of torture. He practiced electric shock tortures, hanging you upside down for days at a time, starvation methods, feeding to dogs. The list goes on. It's insane. But I want to touch on Assyrians really quickly first. With the Assyrian people, so you made a good point. You made it clear that Saddam didn't care so much of culture and ethnicity. It's more so about politics. But the Kurds had their own political parliament that they were trying to establish, which was Saddam was suppressing. And then the Assyrians attempted to do the same thing with the organization called Zoa. He had, there was three founders. Uh, they were executed under Saddam Hussein. Assyrians weren't able to celebrate the Assyrian New Year's openly in the streets. They weren't allowed to call themselves Assyrians to what I've heard from people from that region at the time. They had to call themselves Christian Arabs. We, we said that the Ba'athist party is, it's a national party. And let's clarify that. It's a communist party that believes in one Arab nation, correct? Mm -hmm. So to admit that there was anything before Iraq was to basically admit that there was no Iraq at one point, meaning that there were people before Iraq, meaning there was people before Saddam Hussein. Yep. So the people who originated in that land, who owned that land, the land between the two rivers were the Assyrian people. Yeah. And so when Saddam came, he was so, so infatuated by the history of the Assyrians that he said that he was a reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar and he started to rebuild Babylon. Yes. He found a village that he thought Babylon would look beautiful in. Yeah. So he demolished a village where people were living their lives thriving so he could build this little castle made of bricks. Yeah. And in each brick that he laid down, every single one had his name uh, in it. In it, yeah, he inscribed each of his names Saddam Hussein in every yep. single brick. His initial, yeah, he would be because he said that he was a reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. So my point of saying all this is, is that he knew about the Assyrians, he knew yeah. about what came before him, but he still had them be called Christian Arabs. You're Iraqi. This, yes, you are not allowed to celebrate your political party. You are not allowed to celebrate your Assyrian New Year because we cannot admit. There were people before Iraq. That is actually a fact, but that goes back to my original point, is that was it only just the Assyrians that were not allowed to um, celebrate their ancient history? The Shia wanted to practice their own religious um, practices, believing on Imam Hussein in the South. And did Saddam really prevent them from all of it? No, Saddam says you can absolutely go to the tomb, you can visit, you can walk to it, do whatever you got to do. But if you do some of these traditions that would disagree with the ideology he has, mm -hmm. that's when he would go hard on you. So, so the truth is, Saddam wanted people to celebrate their backgrounds, but moderate ways. Like and more, and, a, and a privacy yeah. and nothing that is way to an extreme. He had a limit on things. And the people that actually forced those limits were the Ba'ath Party members mm. in those cities. I mean, I can guarantee you there are some Assyrians who were members of the Ba'ath Party. Sure. And have probably told the other Assyrians, here's what you can do and here's what you can do. Mm. The same thing with the Shia. Uh, the Shia in the south, majority of the people in the south were Shia. We had some Sunni minorities who also were part of Saddam's government at the time, were very influential. But believe it or not, some of the most lethal Ba'ath Party members in the South were Shia, were cousins and uncles of yours. It's important to note that yeah. Saddam was Sunni, and he, yeah. him, he had a beef with the Shiite. Yeah, I mean, the truth is Saddam really uh, didn't care um, what your background was. Saddam cared about your loyalty to the Ba'ath Party, regardless of what your background is. And 
you know, I have mentioned that before. Actually, Saddam trusted Christians more than Muslims. Saddam trusted Christians more than Muslims. That's a fact. How when so? you go to Saddam's kitchen and his palace, you got to find the ethnicity and the background of every single person that made food for Saddam. They were Christians. Because he was afraid the Shiite would poison him. Not just Shiite. He's, Even he's afraid of Muslims in general. Even his own Even his own sect. people. Anybody tells you that the opposite is, is wrong. Saddam had Christians working in his kitchen making food for him. Because he trusted them. Not to a point he, it was more about a trust, but he thought they would not dare do what Muslims would do to him. So he had... A very different mentality that you can never think of. Why would I put a minority in my kitchen making food for me versus Muslims? So Saddam was way above the religion, the backgrounds, and the ethnicities. I see. Saddam looked at humans in a very different way and through his eyes. So going back to him being a nationalist for Iraq, this is one thing that I'm struggling to understand. So I'm hoping you can shine a light on it. You had a friend who uh, will get to your, your interaction with the military, you joined the military and becoming an MOD, but you had met someone who used to be a surgeon who then served with you in, the, uh, in your operations in Iraq, who was a professor prior to that. And the, the, Saddam had a problem with educated, smart people. Yeah. If you were a lawyer, an engineer, a, a surgeon, a doctor, no. because he thought you were educated, that you would learn the truths about government he yeah. thought educated people would be more anti-government so he would either execute or imprison yeah. educated people if you're such a nationalist and you want the world to be looking at iraq and be like man i respect this country because the best engineers yeah. come from iraq the best lawyers come from iraq yeah. but all these smart people are all of a sudden getting executed or thrown in prison how yeah. do you expect to have any respect from the rest of the world you could be educated in saddam's government only with limits meaning oh, so. Don't let your education fool you and take you to a point where you think Saddam is wrong. It's very simple. Saddam actually eliminated the title of any person that was educated that was serving in the military or doing anything. Because back in the day, he used to say, General so-and-so, doctor so-and-so, general and a doctor of so-and-so. Saddam eliminated your educational status, meaning you cannot say, I am Dr. Ali, I'm Dr. Muhammad, I'll whatever. You have only to say who you are and what your profession is because Saddam did not believe that anybody was above the Ba'ath Party or above what he believed on. So <laughs> he was okay. very, he was fine with you being educated, mm -hmm. but don't ever be too educated where you're going to be disagreeing with his ideology. It all comes down to the ideology of this dictator, what he really wanted to see in people. But look, when Saddam needed an advice from somebody, he wouldn't take this advice from Ba'athist party who had really no backgrounds in education. He will absolutely consult with people who are educated mm -hmm. and take the right advice and make his decisions. So he wasn't really all against educated people, but he allowed you to be educated with limits. You have to be educated with loyalty to the Ba'ath Party and Saddam Hussein. If you are too educated where you think Saddam is making the wrong decisions, you know what you're going to end up. So moving on to now 9-11 happens. Yeah. People are saying in America, the sentiment all of a sudden becomes yeah. weapons of mass destruction and Saddam Hussein is uh, partnering up with Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. You saw it in the streets that you said in your book, when America was hit, your neighbors and the Ba'ath Party members were celebrating in the streets saying, we got the enemy. Yeah. How accurate is that? Oh, yeah. I mean, that is accurate 100%. Anybody tells you in Iraq they were sad or anything like that during 9-11 because America was looked at as the most rival enemy to Iraq. By every I, citizen? Of course, by everybody. And, and whether you believed on it or not, you had to show and express your hate towards America. Because since 1991, America became the rival, the biggest rival and the biggest enemy to the Iraqi people and to Saddam Hussein's regime as well. So of course you had to show any kind of animosity against the United States. So when 9-11 happened, actually that was my first time learning about Al Qaeda. I didn't know what Al Qaeda was at the time because Saddam did not believe in religion. Mm -hmm. Saddam believed in the ideology of the Ba'ath Party. We did have people who were a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, which would line the same ideology as Al-Qaeda, but they were also put in prison. They were also executed. They were also ejected out of Iraq. So 
when it comes to 9-11, uh, at the time people were celebrating, uh, my first time in my life I heard the name Osama bin Laden. And all I heard from my Bathurst neighbor who came out, he said, Sheikh Osama had hit America with the hardest hit. And of course to me, thinking at the time that there's all kind of emotions, right? Uh, you couldn't really express your emotions. I, I did believe that was the most horrible thing, watching people fall from buildings and dying and, and celebrating someone's death. I'm like, you know, whatever it is, you didn't hit America or hit the American military, you hit American people, right. you hit citizens. And of course, there was mixed motions at the time that what really was going on with Saddam, where does he stand on that? When it comes to the truth about Saddam and Al-Qaeda, there was a video of Saddam Hussein saying, which would put any argument to sleep about Saddam's relationship with Al-Qaeda. There was a video of Saddam Hussein sitting on a table with three of his ministers saying that they accused me of being connected to Al-Qaeda and I would have been actually honored to be connected to Al-Mujahideen, who he called them at the time, Al-Qaeda. It's very simple. It puts that, it puts that argument to sleep. So, the, so that's the, the main thing is saying that now America is like, oh, there was no connection between Saddam and Al Qaeda. That was all BS. So you're saying that there was indeed a connection. Look, Saddam actually was the one who initiated that connection with Al Qaeda. There was an Iraqi intelligence officer who was assigned by the Iraqi intelligence to build a relationship with Al Qaeda and had met with some members of Al Qaeda at the time, including Osama bin Laden. So anybody that tells you that Saddam did not have absolutely anything to do with Al-Qaeda is a big lie. Because the video of Saddam saying, I would be honored to have a relationship with Al-Mujahideen, in which technically Al-Qaeda, which he called them Mujahideen. He didn't call them terrorists. He didn't call them anything. Even though Saddam disagreed with far religious individuals. So it was a clear Saddam was going to team up with anybody that was against the United States. So I think that there was more evidence out there indicate that Saddam wanted some kind of relationship with Al-Qaeda after 1991. I see. And that gives justification as to why America then invaded Iraq. Yeah. That's the, I mean, if you look, if you go to the deep details, America went to Iraq believing that Saddam Hussein had weapon of mass destruction. And my belief is that, yes, America went to Iraq believing 100% that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. So before we get into that, yeah, the Ba'ath Party was strong on its own. But you, when you joined the military at the age of 17 years old, you had boots on the floor and you were fighting terrorists. You yeah. were shooting at them. You've been shot. You've been through war. You've lost men. You, yeah. You've led men into battle. You've had IEDs at you. You've seen men blow up. You've been through the whole entire thing. You saw Ba'athist members and Al-Qaeda teaming together on these battlefields against the Americans. So was it, um, was it the Ba'athist party and Saddam's regime like the enemy of my enemy is my friend? So that's why we're going to team up with Al-Qaeda and get Americans? Or was it Americans are in now, so like might as well, let's just team up? Absolutely, that was the case. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And that's exactly how the Ba'athists... Have I, I do believe some of the Baathists that fought most among Al Qaeda were not religious figures, were not religious people to begin with, but because it was a common enemy and it was the first time Al Qaeda enters Iraq officially. So you have to understand that we didn't have Al Qaeda in Iraq during Saddam. You are not allowed to do such and such. There was no official relationship, but that relationship became official once America entered Iraq. And some of the Baathists, who were former military officers, had a lot of military experience. Al-Qaeda could not have caused that much damage without the Baathists and the former military officers that joined them to fight. So, truly, Al-Qaeda had made a progress in Iraq. They would not have made that good progress in the fight in Iraq during those early days without the Baathists who were there at the time. Back one step so yeah. we can understand the step forward with the invasion of Iraq. Yeah. So WMDs. Yes. In the 90s, sanctions were placed on Iraq because of the invasion of Kuwait. Yeah. It was hard for, what sanctions means basically an economically crippling action placed yeah. on a country so you can't export goods yeah. and now your economy absolutely gets destroyed as punishment for you doing bad things, right? But the people, the citizens suffer. You tell stories about how 
it, starvation, wearing old shoes that were tearing yeah. apart, walking to school, destroyed clothes, hard to eat, all of these bad things that sanctions caused to the citizens. Slowly over time, the um, United Nations lifted sanctions with regulations slowly, and they started to regulate the export of oil, letting Iraq get some money back in. But they had a belief that WMDs were still in question. Iraq stated that until 1998, up until 1998, that 90 to 95% of their WMDs were completely destroyed. So they can get rid of these economic sanctions on them. Yes. How true is that? Okay, so that's where I would like to put this argument to sleep. Because this is an argument that Saddam did not have weapons of mass destruction. Saddam actually did it. Saddam used to have the idea and the project of establishing weapons of mass destruction. And that was something that was given to the American by his own son-in-law when he ran to Jordan. You want to probably know why America thought 100%, why President Bush and the CIA director at the time believed that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. And here's the story to it. It was an intelligent asset. The CIA has opened a line, a communication line with them known by Curveball. So if you Google that Curveball, you will know who that guy is. Al Janabi was a former Iraqi intelligence officer that escaped out of Iraq because his brother was executed by the regime. He was in Germany at the time flipping burgers. And Al Janabi wanted to get revenge against Saddam Hussein, who killed his own brother. Al Janabi have drone plants for the CIA showing them where the weapons of mass destruction were in Iraq. Some of the locations of Janabi have drone to the CIA were actually a legit military locations. And it might have had some kind of a project of trying to have weapons of mass destruction. Some of them maybe were chemical labs. Some of them were maybe uh, places where they try to make rockets of certain capabilities. But Al Janabi had given the CIA at the time 99% of accurate information. And the 1% that was missing was, is there were no weapons of mass destruction. So he kept feeding them right things to gain exactly. trust. And finally, yes. when it came to the one big yeah. thing. Anybody that would tell you that the CIA and President Bush at the time went to Iraq knowing they don't have weapons of mass destruction is wrong. The United States went into Iraq knowing Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. Thinking that he Yes, had. I mean, there is a whole interview on CBS with Curveball himself. His answer, he laughed when he was asked about why, that, why did he lie. And he laughed. And I do believe that that guy specifically, that asset who fed the CIA the wrong information has accomplished his mission and has fooled one of the biggest countries in the world. How does, one man, how does one man do that? How did they not check with multiple sources? Because he was very skilled at what he does. You were dealing with a former spy. And you were dealing with a guy who was actually knew exactly where the military location is. He did give the CIA accurate information in a way. But also he fooled them at the same time. And of course, Iraq was very closed up country. You couldn't really get a clear picture of what was going on at the time. At the same time, what made it worse and made curveball information look accurate is the way Saddam behaved. Saddam pretended that he had weapons of mass destruction. Right. What was so, the logic behind that? I mean, I think the logic behind it was to scare the United States. Was it to scare the United States yes. or to scare Iran? To scare the United States, to scare Iran, to scare all his enemies. And he was really successful at it. So he's kind of, it's his own fault that we believed it fault. too because he was backing up the claims that the spy was giving to America. 100%. So America, in a way, creates Saddam Hussein. Then Saddam Hussein, through his egotism yeah. and people trying to plot his downfall, yeah. caused Iraq to be invaded by America who created him. Yeah, pretty much. So the sad part is that there are people who paid the price of these uh, mistakes that were happening from either side. Did Saddam not have any weapons that were scary? Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. He had chemicals. There are videos that I can provide you with. Anybody in the world would argue this. I can provide him with evidence that I have right now that I could show him Saddam had some kind of labs, try to make chemical weapons. He's trying to make viruses. He tried to do everything. Mm -hmm. He had a, a scientist that was assigned to create things to hurt people. That's very clear. And I think any dictator, you know, all the way down from Hitler, 
in Germany to, to Saddam Hussein always had the ambition of creating something to hurt people with because they wanted to be untouchable. Um, am I sad that Saddam got taken down by America? No, I'm not sad because I'm not a Baathist. I don't believe Saddam was going to be any good future for Iraq. Saddam was going to hand the power to his sons and his son was going to hand the power to his grandson and would have been a slave of this dictator. To Uday or Kusev? That time it would be Kusev because Uday was already messed up. You know, and Kusev actually was the, the, the person being prepared to be handed the power if Saddam had passed away. The younger brother. Yeah. Let's say 2003. Bush knew 1,000%. This is hypothetical. Let's say he knew 1,000%. There's no WMDs. There's no connection to Al-Qaeda. He comes out to the public and says, we just want oil. Let's just play this game. We just want oil. Yeah. For what America did, you suffered under Saddam. You had two uncles executed. Yeah. Your grandfather's farm was destroyed. You've watched people be eaten by wolves because their bodies could not be buried because of Saddam's Republican Guard killed your neighbors. You had to flee into a swamp. You've suffered atrocities under Saddam. You were thrown into prison at 12 years old. Your family didn't know where you were at. All these things happened to you under Saddam. Let's say Bush comes out on TV. You're watching. There's no weapons of mass destruction. We know that for a fact. We just want oil. America comes in. Is that a fair trade? Oil for American troops at that time? I don't think that's the case. And it's not a fair trade. I don't believe America went to Iraq for oil. Uh, that is a, a conspiracy theory that was America had spent more money in Iraq than w- what would have made out of Iraq. That's the truth. How much money did America spend in Iraq in that five-year war between 2003 and 2008? It was billions of dollars in military equipment and troops and everything else. So... You know, that is a very uh, old argument that, yeah, America went in there for oil or for the goods that was in Iraq. Um, and at the time, Iraq was really didn't have anything else of a value other than oil. But no, the, the truth is, so the United States had went to Iraq because they were afraid Saddam have some kind of advanced um, weapons of mass destruction program that was going to destroy the world with. Everybody believed that, including Israel. Everyone in that area in the region believed Saddam was up to something that was not going to be good to the world. So let's take a step back and talk about the prison systems one more time. Because yeah. something interesting when the Americans came in, there was the prison systems and then the underground prison systems yeah. that nobody knew about. Yeah. When the Americans came in, they found the underground prison systems and they let men out. And these men asked questions such as, is the Iran-Iraq war still going on? That yeah. ended in 1988. Yeah. We're now in 2003, 2004, 2005. Yeah. These men were in there for decades, underground, yeah. no light, covered in feces, yeah. starving. Yeah. And the Americans freed them. Yeah. So you could give that a tally to the Americans doing something good. Yeah. Did the Americans do more good for Iraq than bad? When we look back at it, Monday night quarterbacking, Retrospective. Let's be honest. Politically, the Americans made a mistake by allowing the wrong people to take over Iraq. That's the only because issue they that... believed that the enemy of Saddam is their friends. Right. Well, the enemy of Saddam's later became the United States enemy, Iran. So, did the Americans really do all bad in Iraq? No, that's absolutely false. The Americans did Iraq some good because the younger kids that were growing up during my time, while I was fighting this enemy, were educated. The right way, not under the influence of the Ba'ath Party. It mean they had a choice. They had a way to think and make a choice which side they should go with. Perhaps Iraq today, you got people who are very far Shiite all the way. You have people who are very far Sunnis. But you do have a lot of people that believe none of that. You do have a lot of educated younger ones that stood against the government of Iran, stood against the government of Iraq, who was ran by Iran, and said that we want to be free. This is called the effects of the American soldier in Iraq. And what did the Iranian influence and the Iranian government and the Iraqis who are ran by the Iranian government in Iraq say about these individuals who stood up in 2019, 2020 against the government of Iran said these are the agents of America and these are the sons of the embassy, which meaning the American embassy. The truth is these people have nothing to do with America. 
this, the truth is these people have no interest with America in any way. They just happen to be people who stood up asking for their rights as an Iraqi, asking for the rights to have a job, asking the rights to have the right education, asking the rights to have electricity, to have roads, to have a proper, a life they can, with the respect that they can live. That's all they ask for. So we see in today's time now where videos are coming out where people are throwing shoes at George Bush. You see arguments on TV. You killed 1 million people in Iraq. 300,000 innocent Iraqis died. When Iraqis first saw American soldiers, what was the sentiment like? They were probably the happiest people on earth. Happiest people on earth. Yeah. I mean, there's videos showing us how happy the Iraqi people were. Must have down for that long. They were celebrating. They were dragging his statues all over the road. See, there's all kind of mixed emotions when it comes to that. Same people that celebrated Saddam being taken down in 2003 later on regretted doing this act because the people that came over right after Saddam was just 20 times worse than Saddam. And that is the truth that nobody would tell you in this world. People are very biased when it comes to things. And that is the one thing that I learned from my experience is how to really look at things from a different perspective. The people that celebrated Saddam Hussein, that celebrated Saddam Hussein being taken down in 2003 thought that their lives would be going towards the better. And that's why they were celebrating the fail of Saddam Hussein. They realized later on, after all these years, that the people that came, that were against Saddam, the people that were supposedly the resistant against Saddam, who came over to Iraq and took over the Iraqi political procedure or the Iraqi power and ran Iraq, realized that Saddam wasn't wrong when he said they were thieves that were looking to steal Iraq. The difference between them and Saddam is very big. Saddam's a nationalist that loved his own country. The difference is that the thieves that took over after Saddam were an agent of foreign countries who have no loyalty for Iraq. And this is ISIS, this is... Not just, no, no, they're talking about the politicians that, that took over after Saddam. Some of these politicians were loyal to Iran. Some of these politicians were much more loyal to Iran. Saddam was not wrong about, wrong about them that they were looking to steal Iraq. Because what did they do to Iraq right afterwards? Each and every single one of them was not there to benefit the country, was there to steal it. And that is a proven fact that happen in Iraq right now. And despite of the good things that are happening in Iraq, despite of the newer generation that is much better than the older generation, because they did not live under that dictatorship, they were raised differently. And that's called the influence of the American soldier because it's not all bad. Mm -hmm. They learn things from the American soldier. They learn to open businesses. They learn entrepreneurship. They learn to, to build big buildings. They learn to build malls. Iraq didn't have big malls during the 90s. All these malls were built later after that five-year war in 2008, 2009. Iraq went towards building and doing things. So there's all kind of different ideas into what this brought to the table. Um, I didn't know who Saddam resistance were until 2003 when these politicians showed up. And I thought these were ethical people, were called jihadists that had a with the jihad against the Ba'athist party and they were people that were, you know, kicked out of the country and happened to be good people because Saddam was the only evil one. And I actually realized that Saddam actually had more morals as an Iraqi than these guys did. That says a lot. Yeah. About how moralistic yeah. they were. Yeah. So I guess my question is this. Those malls and the, and the new way of life that these people are growing up through, was it worth the innocent deaths? Because it's hard to compare saying all these great things are starting happening now. How justifiable was all of that in terms of the innocent casualties? You know, there's a saying that says, what punishment of God are not gifts? They're... Unfortunately, the, the death you saw during that war, you know, there is nothing worth getting a life back. Life is the most precious thing a human can have. Mm -hmm. Their life and their freedom is the most important thing you need in life before anything else. But unfortunately, that is how much and that is the price you had to pay to get people that think differently in Iraq. And yeah, nothing was really worth it at the time. But was these people really fighting for Iraq? 
I don't believe so. Some of these people were fighting for their own agenda. Some of these people were fighting for their own God. I'm talking about God, not I'm talking about God itself. I'm talking about the religious figures they believed on that was prized so bad. There's a, a new thing in Iraq, a term actually, it's a slang term that's, that's called the red line. A red line is a person you can't criticize, you can't talk bad about, and you cannot disagree with. Sounds like Saddam. Sounds exactly like Saddam. So what happened was is you lost Saddam and there's a thousand Saddam showed up and each and every one of them has his own territory. And that's exactly what's happening in Iraq. So one bad guy goes, a thousand come up. That's exactly what happened in Iraq. In Iraq right now, there is a freedom. There's a freedom of speech. You can do whatever you want. But if you talk about the wrong guy, you'll die. It's very simple. Is there anything different about Saddam and these guys? There's no difference. The only difference that... The possibility is back in the day, if you avoided Saddam Hussein, you will have peace. You don't have to talk about Saddam. That's one person. But the possibility today for you to run to the wrong, wrong person is much higher because there's a thousand Saddam. And each and every one of them has a gang or an army full of weapons. Some of them almost have more weapons than the Iraqi military itself. Okay, let's play this game then. Yeah. Was it... Would it have been better to leave Saddam where he was so these 1,000 Saddams don't pop up? Or was it better for America to go in, but we pulled out too early and we didn't let Iraq develop the way that it needed to to make sure 1,000 Saddams didn't come up? See, I think America was unprepared going to Iraq. Uh, there was this little genie that America let out, didn't realize how powerful you know, this would be, that's called the Shia politicians, the majority. These Shia politicians, people didn't realize their loyalty was not to Iraq. The loyalty was the countries they come from. Their loyalty was to Iran. These people were not regular people who are not regular politicians. These people were radicals that was loyal to the Ayatollah of Iran that showed up in Iraq and has no interest in seeing Iraq do any better. Their loyalty was to the country of Iran and the government of Iran. That is actually like a cancer that took over Iraq. Saddam fight with Iran was very ethical. We thought he started that war. Mm -hmm. And now based on the influence and based on the problems that we face today as a country in Iraq, we knew that Saddam was right. Everything he said about the Iranians were absolutely a fact. I don't like Saddam. His regime put me in prison. I think they're radical dictators. They're, the Ba'athists are absolutely dangerous. But when it comes to his own enemy, let's be fair and let's put that in the scale in a, in a good way. Iran absolutely had interest in taking over Iraq. So were these Iranian politicians born and raised in Iraq, people thinking they're Iraqi citizens? Yeah. Or were they sent over, then they worked their way up into po political positions? How were these? The main thing you're saying right now is that there were people that were non-Iraqi. Yeah. Iranians yeah. were going into Iraq politics and corrupting the system from within. I mean, there's some of them were born and raised in Iraq. You're talking about some of the influential Iraqi politicians right now in Iraq, who is the battle core. The battle core was hosted by Iran, was taken care of by Iran. These individuals have absolutely no interest in building Iraq. These individuals have only one interest, is to make sure Iraq is a backyard for Iran. Where was there more corruption? And American soldiers that were free roaming and, and committing horrible acts against Iraqi people? Or was there more corruption in the terrorists, Al-Qaeda and Ba'athist party members in Iraq? The Americans came to Iraq, didn't really, didn't really force or teach Iraqi politicians to steal the country of Iraq. The Americans came to Iraq and they were very naive, not knowing who they let in into Iraq. They didn't know. By the time they realized it was too late. When Saddam was in power, there was some corruptions due to the sanctions. Because when you're we don't, you're not, when you don't have meals to eat, you don't have food, enough food to eat, you're going to be corrupted trying to find any way to eat. But did Saddam really steal like the way these people stole Iraq? Saddam was looking to trying to make Iraq a little better, trying to build, trying to build bridges, trying to look at all the infrastructure was built under Saddam, the palaces, the bridges, the things. What did these people came from Iran? Supposedly, the ethical Iraqis who were fighting against Saddam, what have they really built so far? They really haven't done to the Iraqi people. They will steal 95% of a billion, put it in their pocket, and they will do something with the 
And that's been the case, and that's what's been happening to Iraq. The Iraqi people and the Assyrians, when the Americans came in, you said that it was the happiest day of your life when you saw the Americans. A lot of people felt that way. They were cheering in the streets that the Americans were back for good this time, they thought, tore down the statues of Saddam. What were the bad things being said about the Americans? Why would Iraqis hate Americans coming in? The citizens, rather. Okay, I mean, it depends on the what kind of citizens they were. You know, every citizen in Iraq had a, his own belief at a certain point or his own figure that he followed after Saddam had fall down. You got the rise of Muqtada Sadr, the Shia clerk mm-hmm. that popped up. You had people were following their emotions and didn't really realize what, what whether they were dealing with. I mean, people thought Iraq was going to be the richest country in the world. After Saddam fell, people thought they were going to get money out of the oil pr- pr- profits that the country of Iraq would get. Um, none of that happened because Iraq did have money. Iraq did have capabilities. The United States have pumped a lot of money, infrastructure to be built. They were trying. I served with the Americans. They were trying their best to get Iraqis to build their own cities, to get Iraqis to do something good for their own cities. Look, the truth is, 95% of the Iraqis at the time were there to steal their own country. Nobody has the guts to say the truth that the people that stole Iraq after 2003 were not Americans, they were Iraqis. It was our own people. Because we allowed corrupted people to take over power after Saddam. One of the most famous sayings of Saddam Hussein is that these are thieves who want to take over the country and they will steal the country. And as a dictator, he was not wrong. They were thieves that were getting ready to steal the country. If you go right now to Switzerland to check the bank accounts at some of these individuals, you probably have never seen their face before. It's absolutely insanity. Billions and billions of dollars under people. You don't even know who they are. Where do they get all that money from? So fast. So Iraq's money was stealing, not by aliens, was stealing by Iraqis. People who were born and raised in that country who did not have any loyalty to that country. So that makes Saddam argument right. Saddam believed he was the only one who could rule Iraq to keep everybody in check. Quote, you are going to fail. You are going to find that it is not easy to govern Iraq. You are going to fail in Iraq because you do not understand the language, the history, and you do not understand the Arab mind directed towards the Americans. Yeah, that's true. It's true. That was a true fact. If you look at the history of Iraq, President after president, leader after leader was dragged on the street and killed. The truth about the Iraqis is no one can control them, including the dogs of Iran that are running the show in Iraq right now. No matter how powerful they were, they still had a percentage of Iraqis in 2019, and the millions went out protesting against them. The truth is Iraqis could never be kept in check. Through history, Iraqis killed and dragged every single pres- president of theirs. Jalal al-Talabani, I believe the last president of Iraq who passed away, the Kurdish leader, was probably the first president in Iraq history to die of natural causes and not be dragged or killed or hanged. That tells you what kind of a people the Iraqi people are, is that if you are not a dictator like Saddam, if you are not a tough guy, if you are not a brutal, vicious person, Somehow they'll climb your palace and throw you from the top of it. That's what the Iraqi people are. So Saddam realized the psychology of controlling such a very resilient nation that would not be easy to control, that he had to, to go as hard as possible, and he had to keep his sword sharp at all time. So that's what Saddam believed. I understand when it comes to the the Arab mind specific that you have to implement these strategies as Saddam has proven. But the hard thing that I'm trying to cope with is the fact that he was also a dictator. So what he would do is he would go and sleep with anybody's wife, even if it was his friend's wife. And then he would go and give them prostitutes to say, yeah, forget about your wife for the night. I'm going to give you these prostitutes. And then his son Uday was an arguably the antichrist on earth. He would go to brides marriage days their their wedding days he would sleep with the bride on her yeah. rape her essentially on her wedding day and then one of them even killed herself in front of her husband jumping off of a balcony because Uday raped her on her wedding day he would feed people to dogs he 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 would uh he he actually shot his uncle just to mess with him yes. because he could 
He was head of the Olympic Committee, and he had his soccer yeah. players, when they lost a, a, a match, sleep in barnyards yeah. with cows. And when yeah. he realized the soccer players were sick, he didn't want the cows to get sick, so he moved them. Yeah, so Not because true. of the people, because of the cows. He that's didn't want true. the cows to get sick. He didn't want the cows to get sick. I mean, look, there these story, stories are existing, and there there is a lot of truth to them. There is some information that was absolutely inaccurate about some of these stories and a little exaggerated by the enemy of Saddam. Uday, Saddam Hussein's son, was an absolute crazy person. He was insane. That was a psychopath. It was his little behind child that was a little bit out of control. Did Saddam really allow his son to do that? No, Saddam have tried to punish his own son multiple times to prevent him from doing the things. Perhaps it was one of the biggest smalls in his, in his life that Uday was a little bit out of control because Uday had the power. He was a spoiled child. He did rape women. He did do a lot of these things, absolutely. Um, and they kind of gave him the, the Olympic Committee to just kind of give him something. Mm -hmm. He needed to be busy with something. Uh, at certain points, Saddam was actually trying to control Uday because Uday was going out of power. When Saddam shot his uncle, it wasn't really to prove a point. It was actually so Uday was drunk. Yeah, at a and brothel. Uday was shooting uh, bullets in the air while the the wife of the president of Egypt at the time, Hosni Mubarak, was in the other palace next door, and they were trying to really just control him. And Uday was absolutely insane psychopath and i think one of the incidents that uday shows up drunk to the tv station and told him to announce on tv that he's the new president of iraq <laughs> and they had to actually broadcast it but not broadcast it to tv or through the towers they had to kind of play a video in front of him make him think he was doing something because they were scared for their own lives and until Kuse showed up to take him home, his younger brother, mm -hmm. who was pretty much the 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 mind, the, the more wise mind for the president Saddam Hussein, because he was a little bit more wise. He did he was not really in the public. He did not anything he did did not get around, and he was busy in the government um, doing what he did. But Uday was just completely out of control, and yeah. some of the things he did. I mean, he enjoyed torturing people. I mean, he was the black sheep. He spoke with the list. People mm -hmm. said that he was retarded. Uh -huh. he, he was. And, and you yeah. know, he was six foot six. So he was like the goofy one that stood mm -hmm. out from everybody else in the family. Yeah. He would go to elementary schools and pick up little girls, yes. rape them. He killed some of them in cases, dumped them on the back, back roads of Iraq. I mean, the man was a, was a monster. But one of the things that's interesting to me is that Saddam actually tried to have his son executed. Yeah. Uday kills Saddam's right-hand man, who yes. was an Assyrian Christian man. Yes. Kamal was, Hanna. Yeah. What was his name? Kamal Hanna. And he was his taste tester, his bodyguard, and also one of his chefs. Yes. One night when the Egyptian king or prince was visiting Saddam at their Iraqi palace. It was the Egyptian uh, uh, Husni Mubarak's wife that was visiting, Suzanne Mubarak at the time, yeah. So what happened was, is Kamal Hanna would have a party on the palace right next to where Susan Mubarak was staying. And, you know, celebration in Iraq, they'll be shooting bullets in the AK-47. So they were, Uday have sent somebody to Kamal Hanna to tell him to cool it down. And I think Kamal Hanna did not cool it down because he was drunk. They were known to always having parties and wild things. And it got Uday to go himself and got an argument with Kamal Hanna and end up hitting him mm -hmm. with something that ended up causing him his life. And... That was, of course, one of the most painful things that Saddam was saying because Kamal Hanna was one of the most trusted person mm -hmm. Saddam trusted. He was his right hand. And that goes to back up my early argument about how Saddam trusted the Christians. Mm. He was his most trusted black box. Um, perhaps there was some rumors saying that the second wife of Saddam Hussein uh, that he squarely have uh, was found for him by Kamal Hanna himself. Right. So he was pretty much not just the bodyguard, not just the deputy and the, the, the assistant or the bodyguard. He was pretty much like Saddam pimp in a way. Best he was friend. Best down, best of friend. He knew all his secrets. And Saddam loved him like a son. So this was really hard for Saddam uh, to lose Kamal Hanna the way he did. And 
in a way, yeah, you can say Kamala Hanna was the most influential person in the country. I think uh, Saddam tried to make it up to the family, and then the family of Kamala Hanna showed up and said, you know, we dropped the charges against Uday. I mean, well, yeah. what I believe happened was Saddam sentenced to death. Mm -hmm. Uday's mother pl pled with the Jordanian yep. king, king Hussein, yeah. to ask Saddam to release him. Yeah. Saddam said, all right, well, if a king comes to you in your hometown, your home country, you have to abide. I mean, As a respect, he, he granted him that and sent him to, I believe, Switzerland or Sweden. Let's be honest, they were not going to execute him. Yeah, Saddam maybe was mad because he lost Kamal Hanna, but they were not going to execute him. And instead, they took him to Switzerland and he played poker and he played and he gambled mm -hmm. on a vacation until things got settled up. Which then he ended up killing someone there, and then he couldn't get charged because he's an Iraqi citizen. Yeah, so he was sent back. He is an absolute animal, and yeah, they weren't really going to hold him accountable. And so that was BS. That was a cover. Up. It was BS, and they brought the family of Kamal Hanna, stating that we are dropping the charges, uh, and please let him go for us. I mean, of course, these poor people lost their son, and they probably were spoken to about what to say in front of Saddam so they could put this argument to sleep and let Uday out of prison, supposedly, that went out of prison. He was in Switzerland with his uncle, and he was just out of control. Uh, perhaps one of the most disturbing things that I heard, he when he got to Switzerland in the first few days because all of this thing was going on, he started praying. Uh, he started doing Islamic prayers for the few days, and then within the next week, he was gambling out at the casinos. What a freak. The family of Saddam Hussein's and the tribe of Saddam Hussein has committed more crime than Saddam Hussein himself against the Iraqi people. His family committed more crimes than Saddam Hussein himself. Because the crimes were committed in the name of Saddam Hussein. Because they can get away with it. Because they can get away with it. And that's why. Like, let's be honest. Did really Saddam initiated all these rape, raping and killing and all that? No, he didn't have the time for it. He was the president of Iraq. But he also didn't stop it. That's my problem. Yeah, I mean, because they're spoiled. They are his family at the end of the day. They were spoiled. I want to transition into your military background. Yeah. One one story you tell that I'm extremely invested in is the Battle of Haifa Street. Yeah. You said that it was roughly a three-hour battle. Two, and at an hour and a half. Hour, two yeah. hours and a half? Hour and a half. One hour, hour and a half, half battle. Two hours, yeah. And you were close to running out of ammo, and you say, quote, yeah. I was also shot in the leg, but I didn't even realize it. I took one bullet out of my magazine put it in my left shirt pocket. This bullet was going into my head when the terrorists got to us. I was not going to let them take me alive. 2004 has probably been one of the most worst years of my life because it was the first time in our history to face our enemies in a battle, in a gun battle face to face. You have to know me and most of my teammates who joined the Iraqi military in the beginning, most of us have been to prison most of them has been put in jail by this regime. We had some kind of fear in our hearts against them. We knew they were brutal. We knew they were strong. We knew they were absolutely dangerous. That was the first time we fought them face to face um, in an equal gun, gun battle. And High Fist Street at the time is they, the whole point was it is to capture an Iraqi soldier in uniform so they can prevent Iraqis from joining the fight against, you know, against them with the Americans. Unfortunately, I was put in a situation where I got walked into that ambush by a mistake at the time that was made by our military commander. And they set that ambush. And the person that set that ambush was a former uh, Republican Guard officer known by Said Hitchin. And he put a perfect ambush to capture Iraqi soldiers in uniform at the time so they can behead him on national TV and they can scare people from joining the Iraqi military. The Iraqi military at the time was not as big entity. It was very, very small. We were not even a division at the time. We were very, very small. Uh, you had some ICDC units all over Baghdad, locals that got on uniform. You had the first Iraqi division, which we were members of. We're still getting established and you know structured to be trained and get the equipments in need. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a, in a very tough gun battle inside of Harvest Street in a guerrilla warfare style going door to door. And that was a brutal fight. And that was my first time in history seeing really what a gun battle is like going on, being pinned down and being ambushed and fighting for your life. I mean, we fought for our lives that day. And we thought that we, this was a small few minutes clashes until 
we realized this actually fight going nowhere. You were going to fight to the last minute of your life. The biggest fear I had that day, truly, was to be captured alive. This is a vicious enemy that have tortured people, killed people in the most vicious way. Whether they were Ba'athists or Mujahideen, Al-Qaeda, whoever you were fighting at the time, you knew if you were captured alive, the most horrible things would happen to you. So dying in battle was probably the easiest way for you to get out. And if you're going to get yourself out of that ambush and get yourself to safety, you know your death would have been the most terrible thing out there. So there was a lot of emotions, a lot of fear going on in our, in our mind at the time. Luckily, I didn't know how many guys I lost at that point. And we were just focused on protecting your own five meters that's around you, trying to defend yourself as much as possible. But going back to that fight, um, the scariest part for me was running out of ammo. So when I actually took that bullet, I think I had about 16 bullets left. After I take ammo from dead people, after I take an ammo from everybody, I had 16 bullets left when I left. Until um, an American hero named by Captain Jeff Morris who wrote a book called Legion Rise and actually was able to break into the ambush and get us out. I was very close to running out of ammo and not be able to defend myself anymore. And that was the whole point, the whole ambush, is to get you to fight until you run out of ammo and then they can capture someone in uniform and do what they had, which they end up doing. They end up beheading my uh, battalion leader at the time. They end up executing some of the guys that were injured in the second group that was separated from me. And I had some Kurdish fighters that were in my battalion. They were tough guys, tough as nails. They didn't want to give up. They really been used to it. They've been fighting for their life. At that point, they fought against the Republican guards in the top of the mountains against Saddam. To them, was just another day. And, you know, to someone like myself who was young, 17 years old at the time, uh, it was a scary thing because you were fighting a lot more people than what you have. And they were capable and they were good fighters. You know, they knew what they were doing and they knew the tactics they were following, except, you know, towards the end, they became a little bit more vulnerable. And I learned something that day from that battle that you can never scare an enemy until you kill some of the members among them. And the moment that enemy had some casualties among them, regardless of how weak we were at the time and injured, that's when they really had some fear in their hearts and they started backing up. You were stationed at the military of defense, the MOD in Iraq. During that time, you were your objective was to keep people safe. The Americans also inhabited that building. You got to keep some of the American people yeah. safe in there as well, some high-ranking generals of such and intelligence officers, when you walked in, you saw some of Saddam's old generals and leaders yeah. enter the building, welcomed by the Americans. Why would Saddam let, I mean, the Americans let Saddam's old regime members into the MOD and into the new Iraqi government when the whole point was to overthrow the Ba'ath Party and get rid of Al Qaeda. Yeah, these old people, these old generals had ties to that. So was it like a forty chess move where it's like, let's let some of these people in so we could follow them back to their yeah. cave? Was that the mindset? No, because America was fooled by the Iraqis that came from outside of Iraq, who ran the Iraqi government at the time. You, they did make a mistake. Let the old Iraqi army go. But they made the mistake of bringing the generals from that army back to the military. Thinking like, you know, they were not loyalists to Saddam. They just happened to be there. They actually brought the worst people in the planet that were not qualified to do the job. Which we screamed at the time out of our own lungs, telling the Americans, look, these are bad individuals. These are bad characters. These are not good people are not going to do. But what did these people convince the American government and the American military at the time that this is their own country and we know how to run it? Please let us do it the right way. By allowing the wrong thieves to run the country. That's why the Iraqi military had a lot of corruptions. And that's why Mosul fell in the hand of ISIS a few years ago. The Iraqi people didn't realize, which they regret later, the American soldier leaving Iraq, that the people were trying to get the Americans out, not because they want Iraq to be free, it's because they want to steal Iraq. So that's really the price that the Iraqi people paid by requesting the American soldiers to leave Iraq sooner than it should be. Last question. When you started to side with the Americans, did any Iraqi native ever 
figure out that you were doing it and make you feel as if you're going against your home country? Did they try to make you feel like a traitor? Absolutely. How did that make you feel? I mean, they try to make us traitor, but they couldn't really make me feel that bad because I already know who they were. Who were these people? Yeah, they were bad former Baathist, uh, former Saddamist terrorists. They were really bad characters. And really, um, would I really buy morals and ethics from individuals who never had any morals and ethics? Would I really want to obey to them and listen to what they have to say? Oh, I'm fighting the Americans because the Americans took over my country. Well, you had all the food, the best food. You had all the nice cars. You had the best homes during Saddam regime, and I didn't. So you want me now to obey to you because the Americans are my enemy. Actually, the Americans were the first people to give me a gun so I can fight you, so I can do something against you. So in my way, for people like myself who were... Nothing special under that regime. Didn't enjoy life the way we should. Where I couldn't really open a can of Pepsi. Where I couldn't really afford to have a Coca-Cola. Where I couldn't afford to have meat. To really obey and listen to the guy who wants to tell me, hey, we should fight for Iraq. No, this was your Iraq, wasn't mine. So I think the Americans actually gave an opportunity to people like myself to have an equal gun, gun battle against these individuals who utterly controlled Iraq and enjoyed all its goods and enjoyed their life. So to them, I understand their emotions. They were the big dog in the room for 35 years. And all of a sudden, people like myself come in and try to force the law on them, try to get them to be equal with everybody else in Iraq. I enjoyed the fact that I was fighting for the new Iraqi constitutions, regardless who has been written by, right? Because a lot of them would say the new Iraqi constitution was written by Paul Pramer, which means America have written this constitution. But this constitution gave the right to Iraqis to have an equal rights among one another. And this is what I try to force, try to how I believed in that constitution. And I believe that, yes, all Iraqis were equal. And everybody deserves to have a chance to be part of the government. Everybody deserves to have a chance to... To, to live a, a decent life. And that's what I fought under. And that's what every soldier's mind died for, believing in that cause. Did your mom, dad, uncles, cousins ever give you any problems about joining the Americans? Of course. I mean, uh, people knowing that you are, you look at the time, this was not a powerful entity for you to join the Iraqi military to fight against the worst of the worst of that country. These people have already put fear in my parents' generation heart for 35 years. So, of course, naturally, my parents are going to be scared of them. You know, one of the biggest things that bothered me in Iraq, um, it's an, an Iraqi word. It's, it's called Ani Shaleh. It means it's none of my business. That is the mentality of the older generation in Iraq, is when they saw something wrong, says none of my business because they were afraid of the punishment of the government of Saddam, of the punishment for speaking up. See, that's what I didn't believe after 2003. That I could have like one of these classmates of mine in, in middle school where if I saw something says, Anishale, it's none of my business. And just look at it and walk away. I believed after 2003, if you were killing Iraqi innocent Iraqi civilians and you are the most powerful in that town, somehow I'm gonna find your my I'm gonna find my way into your bedroom and I'm gonna put a gun with a suppressor into your head. And that's what I believed. That to put fear in the hearts of those that scared people every single day. So I believed as powerful as they were, as 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 scary as they were, we had to put fear into their hearts of somehow. And they weren't any better. They didn't want the best for Iraq. They weren't fighting for Iraq. They were fighting for their own interest because they were the big dog in the room for 35 years. They had all the money, all the rewards, all the good life, all the decent things, all the amenities they had during Saddam time. And the guy who lived in the, in the gutter didn't deserve to have the decent life. Um, you know, I think that I don't have any regrets about anything that I have done and some of these moral and ethics that these individuals sold to the Iraqi people that were there fighting the Americans because we want to free you. No, it wasn't because we want to free you. It was because we want to steal you. And that is the difference. Understood. Amudi, thank you so much for making the time. My pleasure.